Let me ask you to take your Bible this morning. We are going to start a brand new study today. And if you ever wondered if Jenny Craig or Dale Carnegie or any of those people that, that make promises to make your life different or make you look different, if there was any substance to that, well, I'm going to make a promise this morning that if you commit yourself to the study of the book of Romans, that you will not be the same after you do that. We are going to look at what is my favorite book in the Bible, and it is written by the Apostle Paul for the purpose of telling a church that has never been visited by an apostle that what the Christian life is all about and what the gospel is all about. So when you look at the book of Romans, it includes in it almost everything you need to know to understand the gospel and to understand the requirements or the expectations or the possibilities of the Christian life. So this morning we're going to look at one verse which introduces to us the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't you like to be a dynamic believer? Wouldn't you like to be somebody who was much like what we envision the Apostle Paul to be like? And in the book of Romans, we are going to get a strong sense of what his thinking process was when it came to his relationship with Jesus Christ. The emperor of China years ago had an orchestra. And somehow, a man who had no musical talent had slipped into this orchestra. And whenever it was time for this orchestra to play, he would mimic what others were doing. He'd pretend to be playing along. And... He went through year after year after year making a modest salary and having this position in the emperor's orchestra. Well, the emperor had an idea. His idea was that every member of the orchestra would give him a solo performance. And suddenly, this man who had been in the orchestra for years but had no musical talent was put on the spot and as the day loomed closer and closer and realizing that whenever that day came, he would be exposed as a fraud and everyone would understand that he never had any talent at all, he committed suicide. And from that event, we get a, a phrase that we still use today, which is called facing the music. He was not willing to face the music. He had put on the charade all, of his, all these years and yet when it came time to actually be put on the spot for a solo performance, it said something about it he didn't want others to know. Now what if you had to do a solo performance today? And I'm not talking about your musical skills. Because many of us have been in church for year after year after year after year. And what if it was time for a solo performance? If someone came up to you and said, uh, can you share your testimony? Can you tell us what this part of the Bible, what you think it means? If someone came up to you at your work and said, can you tell me what it means to be a Christian? How can I become a Christian? Can you pray with me? How would you respond to that solo performance and what would it say about your life? Maybe you realize that you need something more in your Christian life. And this study of the book of Romans can bring you to the other side. If you give yourself seriously to it, it'll bring you to the other side much more dynamic than you've ever been in your walk with Christ. And maybe you'll recognize that you have a need to become the genuine article. But we're going to look this morning at a book that, um, that transformed a lot of people's lives. I could give you list after list of people that have been affected by this book. I would be at, the, at one on that list, but I'm not near as significant as others that I might mention. There was a guy named Augustine in 386. Augustine in 386 was a man who was just overwhelmed with his sinfulness. And he was sitting at a friend's house in his friend's garden. And as he sat there, just overwhelmed by a conviction of his sin, there was a garden wall. And on the other side of the garden wall he heard a little girl singing. And this little girl was singing Toto Lego. Toto Lego. Which in Latin means take up and read. Take up and read. 
And he looked around, because it was such an odd thing for her to be singing, he looked around and he noticed that there was actually a scroll over on a table in that garden area. He walked over, unrolled the scroll, and it was a scroll out of the book of Romans. And it was the book of Romans, chapter 13, where it says, Make no provision for the flesh, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the turning point in the life of Augustine. Now, some millennium uh, after that, in the 1500s, 1511, there was a man named Martin Luther, which you're probably a little more familiar with. Well, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. He was a Catholic monk in the Augustinian order, and he had the responsibility of teaching younger students. And he started to teach them the book of Romans. And he got to verse 17 of chapter 1, where it says, The just shall live by faith. And that went against everything that he was doing as a Christian because he understood it as that you had expectations that you had to respond to and things that you were supposed to do that gained you merit, that gained you favor. And here was this verse that said, The just shall live by faith. And that verse and this book was the beginning of the Protestant Revolution, the breakaway from the Catholic Church. Then you have John Bunyan. And I hope you know John Bunyan. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Next to the Bible, my favorite book. If you've never read Pilgrim's Progress, you need to read Pilgrim's Progress because it brings the truths of Scripture alive in allegory. Well, John Bunyan was sitting in a Bedford jail, and he had the Book of Romans, which he's very familiar with. And while he was in that jail, he took the truths, the themes, out of the Book of Romans, and he put them in allegory, and we have Pilgrim's Progress, which is the Book of Romans in allegory, theme after theme after theme. The first part of the Book of Romans shows us our sinfulness. Pilgrim's Progress, he starts off with a burden on his back, and he doesn't know how to get rid of this burden. The Book of Romans leads us to Jesus Christ as the only solution. The Pilgrim's Progress, he comes to the foot of the cross where the burden is lost. So theme after theme is brought out in that wonderful book. And then you go to John Wesley. And John Wesley was raised by very godly parents. His, his father was a, was a pastor. His mother was Susanna Wesley, who is still well known today. Well, John Wesley came to America from England. And he came here to be a missionary to our Indians. And he went to what is now the state of Georgia. And he failed miserably. At the end of his time, as he was heading back to England, he was even doubting his own conversion. And he said, I, he wrote down, I came here to save the Indians, but who is going to convert me? And as he was going back on that boat across the Atlantic, the boat encountered a storm. And this storm was very fierce. It was so, so wild a storm that the sailors on the ship panicked. And, of course, John Wesley panicked. They were all afraid they were going to die. And John Wesley found that there was one group on that ship that was not panicking. And down in the very lowest parts of that boat, because they couldn't afford any, any more expensive passage, was a group of Christians. And they were called by the name Moravians. Now, Moravians were very committed Christians. There were Moravians who actually sold themselves into slavery in certain parts of the world just so they could reach those sl other slaves for Christ. Well, the Moravians were down there in the midst of this storm, and they weren't in panic at all. They were praising God. They were praying. And this overwhelmed him. He had been raised in a godly home. He thought he knew everything about the Bible backwards and forwards, and yet he had no peace about facing death. And here was this group. They were about to die, he thought, and here they were praising God at total peace. Well, he got back to England. He was walking down a street sometime, sometime later, a street called Aldersgate, and as he passed by a storefront, he heard inside a group meeting. He walked in, and he was in the midst of a group of Moravian Christians. And what they were doing that, mor that morning was they were reading Martin Luther's preface 
to the book of Romans. And when they reached verse 17, the just shall live by faith, he writes in his biography that he felt his heart strangely warmed. That that was the point that he understood, it's not what I do for God, but it's what Jesus Christ has done for me. That if I'm going to be just before God, it's going on the basis of faith. Faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is the theme of the book of Romans, the righteousness of God. It's not a righteousness we gain from our own selves, from what we do, keeping requirements. It's a righteousness, righteousness that is earned by the merits of Jesus Christ. And that is what Romans teaches us. Well, we're going to look at one verse this morning, and that's verse 1. And this is a description of the Apostle Paul, his self-description. And I don't know what you would say about yourself if somebody asked you to de describe yourself. But here we see what Paul would say if he was asked to describe himself. And I think also we get some clues as to why he was such a dynamic Christian. And again, one verse, Paul a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart or separated unto or to the gospel of God. That is his simple description of himself. And we're going to divide that three ways this morning. And if you can have what Paul has in the sense of just these three descriptions, I think you'll understand more about what a dynamic Christian is. The first thing about Paul that we recognize is Paul was a man who knew his master. Paul was a man who knew his master. Paul knew who was supposed to be on the throne. Paul didn't go through waking up every morning and wondering whose will was in charge. He understood that God was to call his shots. God was to set the agenda for every day. That wasn't a discussion for him. God's will was not something that he considered each day. He knew it was a master speaking to a servant. He described himself as a, as a bond servant. That literally is the word doulos, which describes a certain type of servant. Now, a bond servant or a doulos was a person, and in, in the Jewish way of life, they would have slavery. And the way slavery happened, you could actually have a Jew having another Jew being a slave. The way that would, would occur is if you owed money, and you couldn't pay that money back then you would have to sell yourself or maybe even your children into slavery. Now, a Jew could only have another Jew in a servant situation paying back that debt, which we might call slavery. He could only do that for seven years or up until what was called the year of Jubilee, which was every 50 years. So if you were within a range of that, then you could only do it until that year. Everybody was set free on that year. Well, a bond servant was something different. A doulos was somebody who came to the end of whatever the required time was of their servitude. And yet they made a decision at the end of that seven years that they didn't want to go free. They made a decision they wanted to remain a servant of that particular person. And Exodus 21 describes what would happen if a person made that decision. They would be taken over to a, a doorpost, and a, uh, an awl would be taken, and it would be used to strike a hole in their ear, and that hole would be called a stigmata. It would be filled with a, whatever they would use to signify that this person was a bond servant or a doulos. It would be called a stigmata. We get our word stigma from it today. And that person, for the rest of their life, would remain in that position to that master. And that's what Paul is saying that he is that he made a decision, an optional decision, to make Jesus Christ master over his life. That he is a bond servant. Now, if you, would have, if you would have walked through an average marketplace and seen somebody walking along and they had a stig stigmata in their ear, you might think that people would say, wow, what a wonderful servant that they would want to serve somebody for the rest of their life. Actually, what they would say is, what a wonderful master that they must have. So Paul is not drawing attention to himself necessarily here. He's drawing attention to Jesus Christ, his master. He's saying it is worth becoming a servant of God through his son, Jesus Christ. 
that Jesus Christ is so magnificent that it is worth placing yourself in that position and having his will be the will that you live by each and every day. So Paul described himself as someone who knew his master. And when he introduced himself to the, to the Roman church, remember, he is sharing a description about himself. Paul could say, I'm a Roman citizen. This is who I am, who's writing to you. It's like caller ID. They put their name at the front so you know who's calling, who's writing. And he introduces himself as a slave. Now, in Rome, that was the most offensive way that you could introduce yourself. Rome itself had a population of 1,600,000 of which were in slavery to, one, to, to the, the lesser part of the population. And yet Paul introduces himself in saying, I am resting under God's authority, God's position in my life. And I am there by choice because he is a wonderful, wonderful master. Now, can you say that this morning? But every day you wake up, you recognize there is a greater will to serve. That if you take charge of your life, you're most likely going to mess it up. You're definitely going to fall woefully short of what your greatest potential could be. And that God is a master worthy of serving each and every day. And His will is the most precious thing that you can find and live out. Paul's first description of himself was he was a man who knew who his master was. The second part was that he was a man who knew his mission. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. That's the second description he gives. Literally, it's just called apostle. Those words to be are added there. Called apostle. That was somebody who was summoned for a very important task. We would think of the bond slave or the doulos being a, a menial position, but actually it allowed him to be called to a very important place and task. Whenever you place yourself under God's will, it doesn't lessen what's possible in your life. It makes greater things possible for your life. And here Paul is called an apostle, summoned for a very important task. They had the boats back in Paul's day that were called apostolic boats because these boats were designated. They were set aside for a very specific cargo. And they were to carry that on a specific route. And Paul is saying, I have been set aside by God for a very specific purpose. I have been called to that. Now, we're, 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 we're uh, having the patents here today, and, and Sam is coming in view of a call responding to a calling that God has placed upon his life. I am here responding to a calling. I am in the ministry of Sam is responding to a calling that God has placed upon our life. But God's calling doesn't end at the ministry. If you are a Christian, you are a person who is called. And you need to understand what your calling is. And there are a lot of things that we can get involved in in our life. And if you get involved in something that steals away your calling, then you've lost the most precious thing possible to you. Now, I have my keys with me today. And you notice there are a lot of keys here. I guess there's probably a whole bunch more. They're all sizes and shapes. And, and you know, I could take this key, and I have taken different keys. In fact, I fixed our mailbox with a key because I didn't want to go in and get a screwdriver. You can make a key a screwdriver. You can take a key and you can rip paper with it. You can actually take a key. I don't think I've done this. Maybe some of the choir has, but pick your teeth with your, with your key if you get the right one with a sharp enough end. But, you know, you can do all different things with key. But if you really look at a key, a key is a, has a personality. It's got ridges that are just in appropriate places. It's obviously been designed for a purpose, and that purpose is one lock. But you can use it for a lot of different things. And you can live your life out in a lot of different ways. You can use your life to, to, uh, to do this career or that career or, or keep yourself busy doing this thing or that thing, but God designs you for one thing. And as we get under 
his will, allow him to be the master of our life, he'll begin to direct us to that perfect calling that he as the designer has designed us for, where the greatest potential of our life can be lived out. I can find a lot of things to pick my teeth with or to break, break to, to screw in a mailbox uh, screw or, I can find a lot of things to do that. A key will work, but there's only one thing that'll work for the lock. I can't take a screwdriver, not, maybe some people can, and open my front door. I need that specific key because it was designed for that. And if you are just keeping yourself busy, entertained, just going through the motions of life, and never really living out the purpose of God, then you're like a key that's tearing paper. Yeah, you can use it for that, but that's not the design. That's not the purpose. And Paul, number two, was a man who knew his purpose. He knew the design, the mission that God had upon his life. And, you know, every time I, I stand up here and preach, it reminds me that God has a sense of humor because when, when God began his call upon my life, there was no way that I would even consider doing that. That was the farthest thing away from what I considered my capabilities to be. And that just shows you how far off track we can get from what the designer's plans are for our life. When we have the reins of our own life, we'll take, we may take ourselves in a totally different direction than what God's intentions were. But I came to a point in life where I surrendered myself to God and said, God, get me on your track. You know how you've made me to be. You know the direction you want my life to be. God, take me that, to that destination. And it scared me to death. Because all of a sudden, God was taking me to a place that I had never even thought to be an option. And God may do that with you as well. You may have, have taken charge of your life for so long that you may be way off track. And yet God will gently bring you back when you surrender to Him to the place that He, he originally designed you to be. The one thing that, that helped me is that it was drilled into me as a young Christian that God could be trusted. That God could be trusted. That there was no obstacle that God couldn't conquer. There was nothing, no task that God couldn't even take my life and, and uh, bring glory to himself with. And so when you get to the place where your faith in God is at a higher level than your fear of whatever, whatever God might call you to do, as long as you can maintain that, then God can take you to some great destinations in life. But you've got to have a sense of God's purpose, sovereignty, that is greater than any fear that might exist, whatever God might call you to do. You want to know where a list of people who didn't have a lot going for them, except they trusted God, can be found? Hebrews chapter 11. You read through that list and you have name after name of people that didn't have a lot going for them. Moses couldn't have been farther off track than killing people to try to achieve God's will. But God had another way of doing it. Name after name, God arrested them in their tracks and then God got control of their life and took them to his will. You know, Adrian Rogers is a very popular pastor in America today. But as a young man in church, Adrian Rogers was called upon not to preach, but to pray. And when he was called upon to pray, he actually told the man who called upon him, no, I can't do that. In the middle of church, it embarrassed the guy who called upon him, it embarrassed him, embarrassed others around him for him. It so intimidated him to actually be asked to pray in front of a large group. Now he preaches around the world. God had a different idea. When he surrendered to God, God took control of his life, and amazing, amazing things began to happen. So Paul was a man that we remember today because Paul was a man who knew that God was to be in charge and God's mission, God's will for his life, was to be lived out. You know, the will of God is something you would choose if you had sense enough to choose it. If you could see from God's vantage point, knowing the end from the beginning, knowing the value of the eternal versus the, uh, the temporal. If you could see things from God's vantage point, understanding his purpose in things, when he asked something of your life, and you understood it from his 
point of view, unless you're a fool, you would always choose the will of God. The reason we struggle with it is because we're very limited. We don't know the end from the beginning. We're worried about how is that going to work out. What if, what if, what if? Well, God knows all the what ifs. And he called you to do this anyway. We need to have such a sense of God that we realize that his will is what we would choose too if we saw things from his vantage point. Well, let me give you a third thing real quick. My goodness, the time went away. Let me give you a third thing real quickly. And that was that Paul was a man who lived for a message. Paul was a man who lived for a message. Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Here is a guy who describes himself, number three, as being set apart. He understands the message of his life. He is set apart. That the word is literally a word, aparizzo. Aparizzo. It sounds a little bit like the word Pharisee because Pharisees were, were at the same root. They were considered to be the set apart one. But they misunderstood it. And some people in churches today misunderstand it as well. Being set apart is not that we are set apart from, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Paul is saying that he is set apart or separated unto something, not away from something. You know, we get our word horizon from this Greek word. And wherever your life is being lived out right now, that's your horizon. Horizon is something where if you just turn around and look in a circle, you can see all the, uh, the ends of your life or your existence at that point. And we share similar horizons. We have the horizon similarity of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And yet your workplace is here, another person's workplace is there, school's here, school's there. We have like six different schools that kids, our last graduates came from. You know, the horizons are similar but a little bit different. Well, Paul is saying here that he has been set apart, put in a brand new horizon for the gospel of God. That when God found him, this was his life. And when God found you, that was the way your life was. But God actually took your life and put you in a brand new horizon. If you've ever cut cookie dough and flattened it out like they used to before it all came in these rolls and you just kind of sliced it and threw it in there, they used to make cookie dough, flatten it out. I remember my mom doing this. And you'd take cookie cutters and you'd make little horizons, little circles, and cut them out and you'd try to get them as close to one another so you wouldn't have to have as much dough to redo, and horizon after horizon. Well, God took you out of one horizon and put you in another. The horizon you live in now, Christ is the center. The horizon you used to live in, you are the center. Self was the center. So brand new things have come. The old things have passed away. It's like a young man who may have dated this girl and that girl and that girl and that girl, but then he meets Susie, and Susie becomes the center of his life. He's in a brand new horizon. The old things better pass away, and Susie becomes the center of his life. Christ is meant to be the center of this new existence you have. And Paul said that he is set apart, not don't do this, don't do that, but he's set apart unto one thing. And that one thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means every day you need to wake up and think, how can I be obedient to the gospel today? What will it demand of, of me to be obedient in my responsibility to share with the world that Jesus Christ is the only answer. How is that going to affect my life this week? That's when you recognize the horizon that you've been moved to, that Christ is meant to be the center. Fanny Crosby, and let me close by sharing this. I recognize our time is, 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 is gone. But Fanny Crosby is a lady that I am just, think was a wonderful lady. She was a three-year-old child that had an eye infection. And Fanny Crosby was treated by a doctor who put a particular uh, solvent on a rag and put it over her eyes, and it burned her eyes, and she became blind. Well, this doctor was so upset that he had done this to a three-year-old child that he disappeared and was never heard from again, at least not by Fanny Crosby. Well, Fanny Crosby grew up. Fanny Crosby wrote like 7,000 hymns. Many of them are in our hymn book today. Blessed Assurance is, is one of the hymns that she wrote. Pass me not, O gentle savior, savior, I think it's another one. But anyway, Fanny Crosby made a statement when she was older, saying, I wish I knew where that doctor was today, because I, want, I would want to thank him for what happened. I'd want to tell him not to worry about it, 
that God had a greater plan in allowing it to happen. And she was asked, why would you say that? And she said, because I did not have my physical sight, I was able to see things with my heart that may have never been possible. She recognized that God had a plan in this new horizon and that keeping Jesus as master of her life allowed some dramatic and dynamic things to happen from her life. Some years later, she was asked by D.L. Moody, Fanny, if you could have one thing in life, what would that be? And he expected her to say, well, I'd like to see. She said, if I could ask God for one thing, that one thing would be that I would ask to be blind for the rest of my life. He said, why in the world would you want that? He said, I want the first face that I ever remember seeing to be the face of Jesus Christ. And we have our struggles, we have our problems, our difficulties. Fanny Crosby was blind all of her life. And yet she had made peace with that. And she had found that horizon with Jesus, a tremendous place of God, of God working out a great potential from her life. And God waits for us to understand these three keys to being a successful Christian. That every day you wake up and recognize who's on the throne. Every day you understand that you have been called to a certain mission, purpose in life. And that you've been set apart for one thing. That's why God has left you on this earth. No matter what you're busy about doing, God's left you on the earth for one thing. Just I guarantee you, worship services will be better in, in heaven. Preaching's going to be a lot better in heaven. But God left us here because this is where lost people are. And this is where we can reach them with our testimony, sharing our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Apologize.